What does it mean to be from Generation Z? Who are they? How do we know they're different from other generations? And what can we do to assist this wonderful group of individuals? So let's get started. And I thought to get started, we would first look at our generational vocabulary. So baby boomers, everyone has heard of them. Beyond the baby boomers, there have been three successive generations. Uh, some people use generic names, X, Y, and Z. And typically, if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, those are the names that have stuck. Gen X, millennials, and millennials became adults during the 21st century, and then our current generation of college students. iGen is a name more commonly used, I standing for internet, the internet generation. And when you see those span of years, those are when individuals were born in that particular generation. And how do we know that the generations are different? Well, there are researchers who have done surveys every year asking questions such as, uh, did you get your first driver's license by the time you were 17? When did you have your first date? Do you often or sometimes feel alone and lonely at school? And when there are changes in the answers that are consistent, that's how we know it's a new generation. So I'm going to be talking primarily about the work of Jeannie Twenge, who's a psychologist at the University of San Diego, who has done generational studies for many years. And I am going to be in particular comparing millennials to iGeners. So what makes iGeners distinctive? And I should qualify that when I say iGeners, I am talking about general trends. Of course, every student is an individual and has their own path. But as you can see, iPhones really characterize this generation. When I ask in my classes, what do you think most uh, has influenced you in your generation. Social changes, historical changes, technological, they universally say the iPhone. The iPhone first came out in 2007. The iPad came out in 2010, and I'm telling you this because change has been so rapid that by 2012, two-thirds of all high school seniors had cell phones. So cell phones have become pervasive within this particular generation. I have a, a cell phone as well. Um, but what does that mean? And how is that constant contact and that online presence, how can it uh, provide strengths to students and also challenges? So in Jeannie Twenge's work, she has looked at several different changes. So I'm going to be talking about five of them. But I just want to let you know that my two children, one is a millennial and one is an iGenner. And I have been amazed how much the iPhone has influenced their social and cultural worlds. So let's take a look at some of the areas. And here I'm going to talk about five areas of change, again, general trends, growing up slowly. So when did you get your first driver's license? Generally, this generation has gotten it at a later time than previous generations, so we'll talk more about that. Online all the time, so what does that mean? Because there's only so many hours in a day. So what is changed in terms of what students do during the day and how can they spend all that time online. An increase in mental health issues, and this is something Sarah I know will be talking about, but there has been an increase, for example, in depression in this particular generation. We'll talk about that. A career focus. Since the 2008 recession, my students are more concerned about getting good jobs and we see that in this generation, and then inclusive, the most diverse um, and inclusive generation that we've seen yet. So um, how does that impact 
uh, their behaviors and attitudes. So let's start with growing up slowly. Um, and I really liked this close to home comic. I took my, my student, my children, to college not so long ago. And they had a special session for parents. And in that session, they showed this big slide, and they had a list of all the things parents had to do other than being at college with their kids. You, had, you have a job, you have other children, you have other hobbies and interests. You pay attention to those and let us work with your new college students. And it was this, it's this idea that parents and their children are more connected than they have been in previous generations. And that is the case when you look at the trends. Students, when they go to the mall, they're with parents. When they go to the movies, they're with parents. Watching movies, often parents have agreed upon. Um, if friends are with them, the friends come along with the parents. So they spend less time in independent activities. They're also less likely to date, and that's a trend that continues in college. And these are just markers of what we would think independence. Um, they're less likely to drive, parents chauffeur them, and everyone's comfortable with the arrangement as well. And really, this is when, as people have fewer children, they tend to spend more time with them. So this is a natural trend. But these are the patterns that the generational surveys have shown. Uh, students are also less likely to have part-time jobs either uh, during the year or in the summer. And you might think it's because there's more schoolwork, college is hard to get into, classes are more intensive. Actually, the amount of time generations have spent on schoolwork has not changed across many generations, so there must be another reason for that. And students are less likely to drink or do drugs. That's really wonderful. A lot of safety warnings in school that has gone down. And when they get to college, they're not doing drugs. Those are illegal. But they're, um, it may be individuals' first experience with alcohol, which is fine. But there has been an increase in binge drinking on campus as a result of that. So that's something I think that we could certainly discuss and talk about. Students are online all the time. So you have before smartphones and after smartphones. And, and, and certainly a lot of you know, students socialize. But I remember when I saw the first iPhone on the quad, someone with it. And for the first time, I saw a student walking like this. And I thought, oh, that's new. They're not looking at anyone. They're looking at their phone. How much time on average do iGeners spend on their phone? And if you do, no big deal. But on average, it's six hours a day. Okay. Oh. Either checking texts or watching funny videos. I watched one, a chicken playing the piano. Um, <laughs> the chicken was good. I mean, really good. You know? uh, or um, checking social media. And we tease my son all the time. Did you get your Instagram picture? Is it good enough? Did you, yeah, we don't want to do anything until you get the really good picture, right? Okay, post Instagram. Um, or sometimes briefly video conferencing six hours a day, plus watching television an hour and a half a day. So how can you um, do it all, right? Fit all of that in? Well, um, students multitask with your family, you're on your phone, right? You're watching TV, you're on your phone. So your attention is a little bit more divided. And then when you do your schoolwork, you have to really think about how to get it done, okay? But um, we do see more divided attention, which might affect the attention span. And also, uh, in these surveys, iGeners report reading fewer books for pleasure. So fewer books includes e-books as well. There's been a real downward trend compared to other generations. And in the end, the question is, does that affect reading scores, creative writing uh, scores, the kinds of skills that you need? college, so that would be 
the consequence. And there is an increase in mental health issues, increase in depression um, and suicide rates, a real epidemic. Is it because of the time online? Well, to practice this, we humans are social animals. We have a need for social contact. And what happens when that face-to-face -face contact goes away? And students are spending, on average, one hour less a day in face-to-face -face contact with their friends. And you need that time to feel emotional closeness and connection and learn and understand social situations. So very clearly, the study shows more time online. Students report being less happy, uh, more lonely, and more depressed. And you start to see that impact after two hours a day on um, technology on the phone. No matter what kinds of studies, um, people need to be with other people. Uh, there's an increase in cyberbullying, and when my daughter was in school, educators were saying, what is cyberbullying? I've never seen this before, and how do we even define it? Well, by the time it got to my son's generation, it was clearly defined, and they talked about it at school, and that was the big question was how to stop it. So as a result of all of this, in general trends, Students report being more anxious, more insecure, and then needing more reassurance. Okay, and how about sleeping? Well, you have your cell phone sometimes, right? Right next to you. And uh, cell phones are irresistible. They're addictive. You want to check them. So um, are students getting at least seven hours of sleep a day? Many of them report that they're not and that they're um, checking their phone or looking at videos um, and they have interrupted sleep and so they're sleeping more poorly. And this is a little bit in contrast to the millennials. Millennials were very optimistic and uh, confident that they could kind of figure out their own path. Um, eye genders tend to be more um, anxious and they have what's called I'm not, I know, I'm like so old, right? FOMO, fear of missing out on things. So you see that kind of anxiety. This particular generation is very interested in getting a good job, not starting their own business or being an entrepreneur, but mostly what they want is a secure job. I mentioned that economic insecurity. They don't have to love their job, they just don't want to hate it. But they're anxious about getting a good job. Um, having friends at work, that's fine, but that's not a huge priority for these students. Um, they have other right connections, online connections. Students are very willing to work hard, unlike uh, millennials are willing to work hard, but if you say you feud all the money in the world, would you still work? They say no. I Jenners are more likely to say yes. Um, I, I just really want a good job and I want to keep that. Um, but they are more worried about not succeeding or worried that there'll be barriers in their way, such as sexism, um, that may prevent them from getting the jobs that they really want the really good job. So we still see that kind of anxiety there. And finally, these students are the most diverse generation yet that we have had. They're a very diverse group of students from many racial, ethnic, social backgrounds. They interact a lot with students from these different backgrounds, feel comfortable, feel very comfortable about marrying anyone that you would want to, very focused on individuality and respecting diversity and individuality. Very open, very positive about same-sex marriage, very focused on gender equality, this wonderful group of individuals. I think the hard part, though, is when they um, come to college campuses, 
How do we talk about issues related to racism, for example, in a way that students feel comfortable and safe and protected? Uh, and you want that, certainly, to feel comfortable, but how do you begin to address those issues and have students uh, feel that their issues are being addressed appropriately? Um, and well on a college campus. That is a regular controversy that you see on campus today. So I just wanted to end with applications, what we are doing here at Westminster, and I'm from the Psychology and Neuroscience Department, and our departments in biology were very happy when we were picked out of 88 schools us and 11 other schools uh, were chosen to be part of the Council on Undergraduate Research, the Kerr Transformations Project, and the idea here is to infuse more research experiences earlier on, even in the first year, so students feel a part of their major and have a true scientific identity, and our neuroscientist, Dan Buffaleri, designed our research experience teams, which we have just started at Westminster this semester. And in these teams, first, second, third, and fourth year students work together with a faculty mentor who has a research expertise, and they do research together. And the seniors serve as mentors and role models, and basically can say, I was a first year student just like you a few years ago, but now I'm a senior, I made it, and this is how you do it. And the idea is to really provide uh, not just the sense of scientific identity, but to provide an academic community for students so that they can be successful at, guard, at college and truly recognize their full potential. So I would be happy to answer any questions afterward, but I am going to turn this mic over to Gina Van. Thank you, Mandy. Okay, so Mandy talked a lot about the research um, on this eye generation, um, and I want to talk more from a practitioner's perspective. So um, before I kind of jump into that, I want to talk about a few things. First is um, that I identify myself as a scholarly practitioner, which means that I'm working with students on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm taking the ideas and the trends and the theories that Mandy has talked about and that the researchers do, and I'm using that to shape my practice and to shape how I work with students um, and the decisions that I make in crafting programs that they work in. But I also consider myself a reflective pr practitioner. So a lot of the changes that we've implemented over the last few years are, are so the kinds of changes that I have enacted regularly over my career by reflecting on who the students are that show up on our doorstep year after year after year, and they do change over time. Um, so some of that is generational, some of that is personalities of a particular class, um, some of that is change in the demographics. When we have more athletes on campus, how I work with them is going to shift from years ago when we had fewer athletes on campus and, and more sort of um, heavily engaged student leaders, some of whom I can see in this room right now. Oh. So the reflection is, I think, a really important component of being a practitioner and working with the theory. Um, and the last thing that I want to say before I go on into sort of how I do that work is that, um, and Mandy kind of mentioned this earlier, is that there is danger in overgeneralizing a generation. Um, and so it, it can lead us to a place of being critical and um, being overwhelmed and mired in those changes, and I think that that's a dangerous place to be. Um, so I think that it's really important that while we use these as, as trends and guidance and understanding that we remember that every individual student that walks in our door is unique and has unique issues that we really need to hear and listen to. Um, so let's talk about um, the social and the human connection piece and the way that we do that here um, in, in our world. Um, we know now about the loneliness, we know that, that, that the, that's being very much attributed to phone use and internet use and the, and the more digital interaction and connection 
Um, and so when we do what we do here, we're going to be very intentional about creating time and space for human interaction. And that starts on day one. Um, the picture that you see up there is from orientation. Um, many orientation leaders or former orientation leaders are sitting in this room right now. Every single session that we put into the orientation program is thoughtfully crafted to create moments for human interaction. So some of that is really based on this idea of creating some discomfort because we learn and we grow when we're made uncomfortable. Um, and so we do that really very early on with our students through, through the orientation program. We took some risks this year and went a little deeper and um, challenged ourselves and our students a little bit more than we have in the past. Um, and I have not pulled the data yet to see how students felt about that, but I know that um, the instructors who engaged in this process were really very excited about the results. Um, we changed gears a little bit. We used to organize our orientation sections by our inquiry class, which is a first year ship common class, and we moved it to our Westminster classes, which is a transition to college class. The faculty who teach those classes came into the orientation program, um, which, is a, which is a change and a shift for us, but we did that so that we could begin to help foster human interaction with our faculty, meaningful interaction with our faculty and our students. We've also added a peer success coach to every one of those classes. So this is an upper class student mentor, again, aimed at creating meaningful human connection points for every one of our first year students. When they came to orientation, we did an exercise that was meant to go deep. And this was the risky part. I was really comfortable with that. The other instructors that I asked to do that were much less comfortable <laughs> with that. And I think my orientation leaders thought I had lost my mind. We used a poem called Where, Am I, Where I'm From by George Ella Lyon. We asked students to listen to the poem. Then we gave them a template of the poem to create their own. And after they created their own, then they shared that poem back with the class. So this was in their first 24 hours here on campus. The prompts in that poem are not, who am I, where am I from, what is my major, and what sport do I play? The prompts in that poem are, what is the spiritual background of my childhood? What are my family values? What are traditions that I have hold? Um, what have been some difficult pieces of my life? What are some celebratory memories of my life? And so the students had to really be vulnerable and put themselves out there. Yes, within the first 24 hours that they were here. But they did it and they jumped in and they really, we, many of us, as we heard students sharing these poems, were in tears at the how genuine and how authentic and how vulnerable they were willing to be very, very early on in the process. Um, so I've taught Westminster 101 for about four or five years now, and I will say that this particular section um, that I'm teaching this semester is more closely connected, more dependent on one another, and more um, engaging more with their experience here in the first few weeks than I have seen in the last number of years. So I'm really excited about that risk. Hopefully they'll tell me it was a good risk for them too when I pull the data. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Okay, so the next area that I want to talk about is um, rethinking how we learn. Um, and, and Mandy set a very good academic example about how we're doing that in neuroscience and, and psychology. Um, and the, the example that I wanted to share here is um, students are telling us, and, and the I generation students are telling us that they don't want necessarily just to learn online. Um, but there is a lot of information available to them, more than there is information that they've ever had access to before. So there is a lot that they can learn online, and it would be very easy to just move our course content online. But what they want is an opportunity for practical application, to take the ideas and the content and the information that they have at their fingertips and be able to do something with that in the context of the classroom where they can be guided to learn from their actual real world experiences and, and move from there. And so one example that I will give um, using Bloom's taxonomy, which is on the left side, so the, the pyramid has hierarchical layers of how we understand information um, and how we can assess student learning. 
over that. And so we, I talk with my Westminster 101 students about um, remembering and understanding is often how you were assessed and evaluated in the high school context. And what we're going to expect of you here is to learn how to apply, analyze, evaluate, and even create. So research examples is creation. Um, even create learning and content and information in your college experience. So the example that I'll give is that students have been learning about alcohol education since they were in fourth or fifth grade. Um, I have a sixth grader who has a middle school health class and they've been talking about alcohol um, and, and the dangers and the risks associated with alcohol since she was in fourth grade. And they hear it again in high school. And then we do it again here in college. They know information about it. We do not need to teach them that same content again and again and again. But what we want to do is ask them to, to analyze it, to evaluate their own situation, to check in on their own values and figure out how um, their use and decisions they make around alcohol are consistent or not with that, and then be able to create their own story and create their own path forward. So in the, in the class, um, the way that we do that is rather than me teaching them or sharing another video or, or passing more reading along, um, we have them come up with case studies. And so we have them think and reflect about their actual cultural experience here since they have arrived here at Westminster. What is that experience like? How is it consistent with their values? How, um, what challenges have they met? What cult, how are they understanding the culture around drinking here on campus? And then tell us that story. So the creative piece is they have this opportunity to write and create their own story around that and share that with us. So, um, so we're doing that both in and outside of the classroom. Um, outside of the classroom, we, we um, I facilitated last year the first Emerging Leaders Retreat on campus with 20 younger students who were aspiring leaders. Um, and we did very similar kinds of activities. Students know and understand conceptually what leadership is. So we draw from their experience, we draw from their knowledge set about what leadership is and how them define that. We do a leadership assessment um, so that they have some language to wrap around their understanding of leadership. Once we've gone through sort of the content piece of leadership, then we have them do some practical application of that. Um, so for this retreat experience, it was a fun and sort of playful way. We created an escape room. Um, they needed to, to complete three challenges to get out of that escape room successfully and gave them an opportunity to work in small groups, to problem solve, to step up as leaders, to step back as leaders, to negotiate relationships in those settings. And then we were able to debrief and process um, with them how that matched, how they became to understand themselves as leaders. So it was a wonderful practical application um, for them of stuff that they really could draw from and already knew. All right. So the third area that I want to talk about is engagement. I mean, engagement is fairly connected to the idea of social. Um, in the student affairs realm and here at Westminster and in the higher education landscape, we equate engagement with retention. Um, the more engaged students are, the more likely they are to stay and be successful at the institution um, that they attend. I would like to move beyond sort of the retention conversation when we think about engagement and to think about what their students are getting out of their experience here. So the engagement is this idea of the social and psychological energy that we put into our experience or into the thing that we are participating in. Um, and I think, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. For our students, it's this idea that you can, you get out of an experience what you put into it. So how they put themselves into this experience here um, matters. So I know Nicole and I have had this conversation a lot over the last couple of years, and the trend that we are seeing matches a lot of what Mandy talked about, this tentativeness of students getting involved and taking risks and, and being engaged in Westminster in the way that we traditionally know our students to be engaged. We've seen them pull out of student organizations. We've seen them get less involved in sort of the traditional ideas of the Westminster student. And so in our office, we've reflected a lot this last summer um, and created a, an engagement framework that we think will help us um, reinvigorate that idea of engagement in the way students see their college experience. Um, if you look at the, the triangle, this is our framework. Um, let me just 
say this caveat, it's an emerging framework, and I'm not always thrilled with that language, so it may change, <laughs> but I'm putting it out there today. Um, the upper three, the interested engagement, involved engagement, and committed engagement are really what we have typically seen students over the years. That is, I'm interested in something, I explore it, once I explore it, I go deeper into it and I begin to be a decision maker and a participant in the work of that organization, that research, that whatever. And then the committed engagement is I am shaping it and I am leading it and I am really getting the maximum amount of my experience here. So that's where we have been and where we have operated for many years. And the student affairs idea is that we create these opportunities for students to get involved in those ways by their own choice, and then we lead alongside them and have them create those experiences. But what we've found is if there's fewer and fewer students doing this top three, what's happening to everybody else? So our office has decided that this year, um, we needed to find a lower level of engagement, another opportunity for our students to um, sort of accidentally, in a happenstance sort of way, land in an opportunity for engagement. Um, and so our, our first sort of foray into that is to create programming happening all the time in Berlin Lounge in the Club Room, which is our primary student programming space. And the reason for that is we're partnering with RAs and we're partnering with lots of other campus constituents to just get students out and over there, hoping that they will land in a place where they can just maybe accidentally find something that they would like to do. Um, low risk kinds of events, low commitment kinds of events, um, and it is the, a very first step in, a, in hopefully trying to reignite the engagement framework. Okay, then the last piece that I want to talk about um, is this idea of cultural competence. Um, and Mandy talked about the inclusiveness and those inclusive expectations of students who are coming through our doors. And there's one example that I'd like to give in how we have done that in the most recent years is through a program called Civil Dialogues. Um, we had an incident on campus a number of years ago where there was polarized views around a social issue and two groups of students came into conflict about that issue. Um, our Black Student Union had posted an awareness, a poster awareness campaign about police shootings of young black men. Um, it was an educational campaign and they had posted those in a, in a very prominent place in the campus center. And which elicited a response from students on the other side of that perspective, which was the Blue Lives Matter perspective. And um, we could have let that play out in a way that they wanted that to play out, but what we decided was to use Krista Tippett's work, she uh, hosts a podcast called On Being, to use her work on civil conversations and created a space to bring both polarized points of view into a room and, in, and encourage dialogue and understanding and have students work through those issues in a place that had, um, that where, the, where the primary purpose was to develop understanding and care of one another in this community. I mean, it was a rich conversation, it was a hard conversation, um, but it really moved a lot of students, not in their own perspective and not in the view that they held, but at least to understand the person who held the perspective different from them was a human worth caring about and worth respecting. Um, so it was a really, really wonderful opportunity and a, and a tool that we can, will continue to use, um, most effective when there is a social conflict happening, um, but we continue to use them to bring light to some, some other social issues. But I think for us as humans, the most important work that we can do around this is to do our own work around cultural competency. Um, and so rather than waiting for a class to come up or um, someone else to tell us that we need to do training, I think it's critical that we take the initiative to do that work on our own. Um, I have two sources up on this particular slide that I think um, are great places to start if you haven't been there already. Um, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria is a book that was written a little over 20 years ago. Um, she has rewritten an anniversary edition of that book, and about the first 80 pages are dedicated to what has happened in our national landscape over the last 20 years that makes her work as critical now as it was 20 years ago when she originally wrote it. Um, so it's a powerful book. Um, it has been a transformative one for me in my own cultural competency work over the last 20 years. Um, and the second book is a, an art, is, a, is a new book that is just coming out. It's a collection of essays written by Peggy McIntosh, and she wrote also about 20 years ago a pretty pivotal 
piece of work on unpacking, um, it's, it's titled Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. It's an article about white privilege, which is a white woman who thought that I had been an advocate for students of color. Um, it was a shocking article for me to read, but what it did cause me to do was really reflect on my own work and how I am perpetuating particular things um, that make life difficult and getting kind of in my own way and doing the work that I felt so compelled to do. Um, so the, both of those articles are really, I think, very great places to start. But I do think that it's very critical work um, for us to do on our own. With that, I will pass it off to Sarah to talk about the last piece, which is supporting our students while they're here. Um. Okay, um, so my role is as the council, one of the counselors here on campus, and um, we, I think it happened two years ago that we became the wellness center. So um, me the medical side of things and the mental health side of things merged together. And, um, you know, I think our team has really been working together very much as a team um, to provide a safe place for students to come and get their health needs met. Um, and I think looking at this dimensions of wellness, each aspect of, of that picture um, are things that we really focus on when a student comes down to, to interact with whoever they're coming to meet with. Um, as the mental health side of things, the goal is to really create skills and, and allow students to know what skills they have within themselves to, to support themselves as they're becoming adults and becoming the people that they're going to be. Um, but we want to help provide, of course, health resources and any kind of emotional resources along the way. Um, so as far as the mental health options, um, myself and Mindy Wise are both um, licensed practitioners. We've been working in outpatient field, field for a long time. Um, so we are providing mental health services as therapists for those students that feel like they need that. Um, and we're very busy, we're very glad that we're very busy. Um, our, our services are short term because a student is here for a limited amount of time, that you're not coming to talk to a therapist for 10 years, you're gonna be here for a limited time. So our goal is to provide what a student needs to make it through college, but also um, in life in general, right? Like just to learn what skills we have within ourselves that, um, and our community as a whole um, to be successful. Um, so we, are very solution focused, we're very um, strengths based. So, you know, helping people see what they have within themselves, what they've gotten from their, you know, life before coming to college, and, you know, what they're learning from just being here on campus. Um, we also provide groups, so that gets back to the how do we, you know, work together to support each other, um, trying to get more human interaction, trying to, you know, not just Google, you know, if you're I'm just not feeling well. I'm going to just Google on WebMD these symptoms, and then I, you know, come up with just this list of just more anxiety-producing uh, concerns. So, um, being able to support each other um, in that way, because of the level of anxiety being, I mean, I think anxiety has always been present, right? I mean, that's a natural part of being a human being. Um, but as we're learning more about anxiety and depression. Um, knowing that that's impacting people in a really very real way, um, and, but not knowing where to turn and how to deal with that. So trying to open up those conversations. Uh, other things that we're providing, um, this summer, right before uh, classes started, uh, Mindy and I engaged with the football team um, and provided mindfulness training um, during their training camp before classes started um, in order to help um, just be able to focus, clear their minds, um, become their best selves while they're on the field, but also just in general, because it's one of those skills that can transfer um, you know, to every part of a person's life. We're hoping we can do more and more mindfulness um, programming across the campus for everybody. Um, we do tabling events, so that gets also at that human interaction, right? Like mental health, something we all need to check in about, make sure we're taken care of. And so we're trying to provide resources and services in a, in a just everyday kind of way, right? Are you checking in with yourself? Are you taking care of yourself? Does someone you know need some extra support? Um, so just trying to be present 
especially during times of the semester that are more difficult, like during midterms and finals, but trying to get there as much as we can when we're not meeting with students individually. Um, we also provide crisis training for the, specifically the residence life staff, um, but then we also did this, a similar training for faculty um, just so that all of, everyone on campus knows what to do if they come across someone who's having a crisis, a mental health crisis, or they're concerned about someone else. So um, myself and Mindy are on call um, every day. I'm currently on call, so if it rings, that's, that's what's going on. Um, but just that, you know, you know students have resources 24-7 um, to take care of whatever mental health concerns they're having. Um, and we also provide, you know, looking at the national trends, um, trying to have peer support um, about mental health issues, anti-stigma, trying to make sure that um, those needs are being met. We're having an event at the end of the month um, for students to check in on their mental health. It's called Fresh Check Day. But to check in and to, are, are they taking care of themselves in the way that can help them be their best self? Um, we're also, uh, these are other, the self-care focus, that's something that, um, you know, we, we're limited. Uh, you know, if, it's, if someone's coming into my office, it's for a limited amount of time. So being able to transfer those skills to, um, we're met, like, we all can take care of ourselves and other people. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about going and getting outside, doing more things on campus where you can be in the natural settings that are so beautiful around here. Um, we have a relaxation room for a quiet space for meditation and yoga so people can come in and just clear their minds. Um, and just general. Uh, oh, workshops, that's another one that we're piloting this semester um, to provide those issues that, you know, in, in the first year that I was here, we were noticing a lot of some similar issues were coming up as far as healthy relationships, appropriate boundaries with friends, with family. Um, how do I solve conflicts with either professors or uh, with my roommate. So we're gonna be offering some workshops on some of those topics throughout the semester as well. And um, wellness coaching is a program that we are just beginning this semester. Um, the, we like to call it the How to College um, program. Um, but just to help with executive functioning, um, you know, as there, you know, the, the trend of other people taking care of me um, that, that, you know, we've mentioned. Um, how, some people arrive here not sure how to navigate this place, um, not sure how to ask, access resources or keep track of a schedule or keep track of all the different demands that are part of being a student. Um, so um, that is an, a service that uh, Mindy will be providing to just be a person to help with those steps. So how do you take on this big challenge and um, live the best life that you can live while you're here. Um, and also that making connections to resources here. And of course, a little, I had to put in a plug for our, a pet therapy as well. Um, that we do have three days a week, we have a dog here for students to come and, and anyone else who wants to come be with the dog. Um, but I think it's just that remembering that we're all humans that we all need all kinds of connections and sometimes it's just good to pet a dog so we've been providing that as well.